Stone is one of my favorite poems. And uh, I, it always gives me pause and really makes me think. So specifically, you lack the sense of taking part. No other sense can make up for your missing sense of taking part. Even sight heightens to become all-seeing. You will not know. Well, what do you know good without a sense of taking part? You shall not enter. And you will only have a sense of what that sense should be, and only its seed of imagination. This poem always gets me thinking about imagination and the role of science. I think that it is underappreciated how deeply, deeply important imagination is in the role of science. I'm going to focus today on astronomy uh, because it's easier for me because I uh, teach the astronomy class and I love thinking about light specifically and I really like thinking about the nature of light as well. <coughs> So I thought about taking this in a more broad sense in terms of STEM, STEM generally speaking, but hopefully we all learned a bunch of biology already this fall with the CRISPR book. I know that I learned a ton of biology and a lot about how imagination plays a role in biology. I'm happy to talk with uh, anybody who's interested afterward about the role of imagination in physics, uh, and we will be sticking primarily with astronomy today. So thinking specifically about this idea of even sight heightened to become all-seeing. Now, we are aware of the um, electromagnetic spectrum, generally speaking, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment, but what I'm going to think about is sort of moving back and forth from uh, back in the day in history to today. So I'm going to focus a little bit on Galileo and some of the things that uh, Galileo looked at with his telescope. He did not invent the telescope, but he did popularize the use of the telescope. Um, I'll show you and uh, talk to you about some of the things that Sir Edwin Hubble was thinking about in the early 20th century. He was one of the very first people to use the Wilson Observatory, which was at the time one of the world's largest observatories, uh, telescopes. It's now pretty tiny compared to many of the telescopes that we use uh, these days. Then, um, moving, continuing to move forward in time, I'll talk a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope, which just came online earlier this year. I'm sure you all are aware of it and following it endlessly in the news, because it's amazing, and those photographs are unbelievable. So we'll look at some of those photographs. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jocelyn Bell Burnell and her use of the radio telescope and some discoveries she made with a radio telescope. And then thinking about um, moving beyond even the idea of sight and uh, Albert Einstein's discovery through mathematics of the idea that the fabric of space and time can actually shape, and then how that was discovered within the last 10 years. So as I mentioned, the electromagnetic spectrum, light. You and I think about it, assuming that, that your eyeballs work in full color, which is not necessarily an accurate assumption, but I'm, I'm going to assume that we all see in full color. Um, we see an amazing array of colors, right? So any color you have ever seen, any color you can possibly imagine, is a, a result of three types of cones in the back of your eyes. So we have red, blue, and green cones. And that allows us to see everything from deep, deep purple to deep, deep red. But it turns out that that is actually just a small fraction of the full electromagnetic spectrum. So it turns out that if we think about light, generally speaking, then sure, we have the gift of eyesight and the ability to see a really gorgeous, gorgeous array, I think, of colors, but we are missing out on the majority of the types of light. Specifically what I mean is that our bodies have not evolved to be able to, to physically detect these other types of light. So from uh, gamma radiation, the, the shortest type, uh, to x-rays, to ultraviolet, we have ways of using these types of light, right? So we can go to the doctor, we can go to the dentist, they use x-rays on us, so we can see inside our bodies using x-rays. Um, we know that we are exposed to uh, too much ultraviolet light, right? Because we get a uh, sunburn. But if we're standing outside in the sunshine, you and I don't have any way of physically detecting the presence of ultraviolet light. It's too purple for our eyes to detect. Um, over on the stuff uh, on the side of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's too red for us to see infrared. So we can also take advantage of that. We use technology like night vision goggles, for example, to see things in the infrared, but we convert it to a color that you and I can see, typically green. Uh, Microwaves, uh, we all know, use and love microwave waves on a daily basis, most likely. Uh, radio waves are used by uh, large portions of the um, tech industry, so like Verizon, AT&T, uh, also police, uh, 
firefighters, things like that, they use that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we are aware of it, we know about it, we can use some of it, but you and I can't personally detect most of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so interestingly, it turns out that astronomy, for the majority of the time astronomy has been uh, a topic of interest, which would be, uh, I would argue, since humans have evolved the, the gift of sight, mostly in the visible portion of the spectrum. But it turns out that if we build telescopes that allow us to see in different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, or in other words, see different colors of light that you and I can't detect, we are going to see some very, very, very cool things. So um, here are just a few different types of telescopes. So on the left-hand side, we've got the James Webb Space Telescope. It's mostly in the infrared, so it mostly sees light that is too red for you and I to pick up. This uh, has been in the news a bunch recently. It was just launched late last year. This is in orbit beyond the moon. So this is a telescope that's more than a quarter of a million miles away from us. It's really, really, really far away. It also will never ever look at directly at the sun or things near the sun, by the way, because it has to stay cold. Uh, on the lower right is an example of a radio telescope. So that's a telescope that's going to pick up uh, radio waves. For example, if you go stand outside the sub, KGLT is transmitting, right? They're transmitting in radio waves, which is a kind of light. You and I can't hear it if we stand outside the sub, but if we get a radio, we can convert those light waves to sound waves, and then we can actually hear those waves. So radio telescopes are really useful. Um, we can look at the sky during the daytime with radio telescopes and not just at night. Up on the upper right hand side, there's the Chandra X-ray telescope, and that telescope looks specifically for black holes, and it does a really, really good job of finding black holes as well. One more telescope I want to mention is a radio telescope. So this is a, a photograph of Jocelyn Bell Grinnell when she was in graduate school. She helped build this radio telescope. Notice that this does not look like a telescope at all, right? And, I don't know what it looks like, but not a telescope. Um, and so it turns out that this uh, thing really does detect radio waves, and it works and functions in the exact same way that other telescopes work. So it just doesn't look like a telescope to you and I, at least not in the traditional way that we consider telescopes. So Galileo, as I mentioned, popularized the use of telescopes. He did spend some time looking directly at the sun with the telescope. We all know, I hope, that that is not a good idea. Um, he eventually recognized that that was not a good idea either. He started out by looking either when the sun was really low on the horizon or when it was a little bit foggy because he recognized that it wasn't good for his eyes. But eventually what he started doing was he started taking a, uh, an image of the sun, projecting it on a piece of paper, and drawing what he saw. And based on that, he was able to determine that the sun rotates. And this is a photograph of the sun that was taken today. Um, and we can see right here, there's a couple of sunspots. So those are dark places, cool spots of the sun. And that's basically what he was looking at. So he watched every single day. He saw those things moving and was able to determine that the sun turns on its axis about once a month or so. Um, I don't know why this is underneath. Let me see. This is actually a YouTube video. Let me see if I can get this played. Oh, please, please, please talk to your neighbor about the joys of PowerPoint while well, I fix this slide.
not eight minutes interesting, I don't think. And so this first caveat, this is not the layer of the sun that Galileo was looking at. We can definitely tell the difference here between this is what you see when you look at the sun. Not that you should go outside and look at the sun, but if you do, I know I do sometimes, uh, it definitely it looks like that. So this is a, a layer of the sun that is further up in the sun's atmosphere. Um, can you all see that up here? Can we have the lights down a little bit? So um, what we can see is that the sun really does ever so slowly turn on its axis. And so Galileo was very, very, very patient in order to observe this rotation of the sun on its axis. Also, uh, and again, he couldn't see this because he was using visible light only. And this is x-rays. And so if we look at what the sun is doing in x-rays, it's doing a lot, right? There's so much more going on than we could possibly see if we were only looking in the part of light that you and I are able to detect. But luckily, we can build X-ray telescopes now and we can see this very, very, very cool stuff that's happening. The sun is incredibly active. It's doing lots and lots of things in addition to turning. And so he saw it. it spins on its axis. It really does. So um, right now, there are a whole bunch of telescopes whose job it is just to look at the sun. Oh, good. OK, so um, what we're seeing here is different wavelengths. So we're looking at different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum or different colors of light. And what we see as a direct result of that is different layers of the sun's atmosphere. And that is uh, a very, very cool thing, I think. So that's similar to what we were looking at. That's going to be x-rays. This is probably ultraviolet. We come down a little bit further. That one's super pretty. Looks like that one's a combination of several different uh, pictures. Oh shoot! These ones aren't coming up. This is the middle layer of the sun's atmosphere. Ah, there we go. At long last. Uh, so there is the visible portion of the spectrum. So that again is the part that you and I see. But every other one of these uh, types of wavelengths, you and I can't see. We have to physically build telescopes to actually understand what the sun is doing at these different uh, wavelengths and hence at different layers of the sun's atmosphere. Why do we care? Well, one of the reasons we care is because if we look at these photographs up here, we're looking higher up in the sun's atmosphere, and sometimes this material shoots off into space, and if it shoots towards Earth, it can hit our planet. One of the side effects of that is aurora, which are just pleasant and a nice thing to look at that. Another consequence of that, though, is that it can ruin satellites. So none of us want our phones to go down, right? So this would kill like Verizon satellites and AT&T and T-Mobile, stuff like that. So when these uh, pieces of material shoot off at us from the sun, we're watching the sun all the time. These telescopes are constantly watching the sun. These photographs are updated multiple times a day. And so we know when this stuff's coming at us, it usually takes depending on the speed, two to three days to get here. And so we can lower all of the satellites into the Earth's atmosphere and physically protect them from these um, from this harmful radiation uh, and particles. Also, this stuff is not good for astronauts. And so astronauts are not allowed to do spacewalks when this material is shooting at us from the sun. So keeping an eye on the sun helps us understand, or helps keep us safe, but also helps us know what the, what the sun is doing on its 11-year uh, cycle. Another thing that Galileo looked at was Saturn. He had no idea what he was looking at. He was actually very, very confused by what he saw. So here, this is just a, a, what, a note in his book, Starry Messenger, and I wanted to point out two passages. This is the only place he talks about Saturn in the whole entire book. First passage. For in truth, I have found out with most intense surprise that the planet Saturn is not merely one single star, but three stars very close together. So he did not fathom rings. He didn't imagine the idea of a planet having rings. And so I can really relate to that. Like we all know that Saturn has rings, right? Many of us may know that Jupiter has rings and that the other Jovian planets also have rings. But if you've never known that, how could you possibly imagine that idea? That just blows me away the thought that somebody eventually figured out what they were looking at was rings. They look very much like stars to Galileo. And one of the reasons is because his telescope was, it was a rudimentary telescope, but it wasn't that great, so it's not surprising. He waited for a long period of time, and he looked again, and what he saw this time, he said, oh, well now it looks like an olive. 
what was happening is that Saturn is a tilt, has a, has a tilt with respect to um, the, the sun's rotation. And what that means is that as Saturn and as the Earth move around the sun, Saturn's tilt looks different from us, or to us. And so in some cases, it looks very much like you can really, really see, see the rings. That's called the open configuration. And then in other cases, it's more of a closed structure. So he was seeing something like this. This is when the rings are more edge on, more hard to see, as opposed to when he looked at it before. And this is many, many, many years later that it, it, it takes for this change to happen. So he did not fathom, wasn't able to figure out what the heck he was seeing there. It wasn't for a couple hundred more years that somebody else was like, rings, it's a thing. It's something that we should consider that planets might have. And so, much more recently, and named after one of the people who first was able to fathom the idea of rings around Saturn, the Cassini mission. And so here's a photograph of the Cassini mission. We can see, this was a huge, huge thing. Those are people down there. So we can get a really nice sense of the scale of this thing. So this mission was a very, very, very large mission, about the size of a city bus or so. And notice, also, it's sort of hard to see in this pit photograph, they were in clean suits. So they were trying really, really, really hard not to get any cooties or anything on the spacecraft before they launched it and sent it off to Saturn. Also, um, and I'm not going to talk about this, but I did want to point out right here, this is the Huygens probe. The Huygens probe landed on the surface of Titan to check it out. It parachuted down and took photographs the whole way down and found methane lakes and methane rivers. So very, very, very cool stuff on the surface of Titan, thanks to the Huygens probe attached to the side of the Cassini region. So what did Cassini figure out? Um, well, the Cassini mission orbited around um, Saturn for many, many, many years. This actually was only supposed to be about a four-year mission, but it was unbelievably successful, and they kept going and kept going and kept extending the mission and looking at different things. So, um, by the way, this is a NASA mission, as most of the missions I'll be talking about today. You and I own these photographs. We own these, this data, and we own the images, and so we have the right to look at, to use any of these images that we so desire taken by the Cassini mission or any other NASA mission. Our taxpayer dollars pay for them, and so we are the owners of these images in a very real way. And so here we can see a beautiful, beautiful photograph. So looking straight down on Saturn, onto the rings of Saturn. Look at those colors. Saturn has some very, very, very cool uh, colors in the upper atmosphere that aren't always obvious and something we cannot see really here from Earth. It really helps to actually go there. There's, um, that is the Cassini division right there. So that, that space between the rings is named after Cassini, the fellow who first named, the, uh, named them or recognized that they were the rings. Um, I spent probably more time than I really should have on the Cassini website just pulling out some images because it's so, they're just gorgeous. I just love them. And so we'll just look at a couple more just because I want to. Um, so on the right hand side, we're seeing again, we can see the rings to this, this time we can tell that the sun is somewhere behind it, right? So the rings are backlit so we can nicely see the icy material that they're made of. Just so happens, there's Earth right there. It just happened to have been caught in this particular photograph. Cassini wasn't trying to do it, but this, this photograph right here, actually, and again, there's Earth if you didn't catch it the first time. Thinking a little bit about hubris this week, maybe. Some of you are thinking about hubris and about pride. Um, that's all of us, right? That's every single person who have ever existed, ever, 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 including Achilles and Menelaus and Agamemnon and Helen, all those people, right? Right there. Um, here's another photograph. I really, really like this photograph. Again, we're looking straight down onto the rings of Saturn. Notice a couple things. First of all, they look solid. They're totally not. They're actually just made up of a whole bunch of particles from the size of motes of dust to the size of buildings. But they're, um, the Cassini mission was far enough away that it looks solid, but it's totally not at all solid material. It's just actual pieces of material. Um, they're primarily made out of ice, which makes them very, very reflective and easy to see, either, even here from Earth with the telescope. So, second thing I want to point out about this particular photograph, and the reason I pulled it is because this is true color. So notice there's some really neat and kind of subtle differences in the colors of the rings. This was something I had not really noticed before I was flipping through these images recently. Uh, here we can see a moon of Saturn right there, Daphnis. 
also, uh, just to the left and up a little bit of that moon, notice the ring material looks a little weird, right? It looks sort of like um, um, when you go through water, right? When a boat goes through water and it leaves waves, it looks a little bit like that. But we'll see a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, so over here, uh, in, if we look at the northern hemisphere of Saturn in radio waves, I'm uh, sorry, in, in the infrared, there's a hexagonal storm. This hexagonal storm was actually discovered by the Voyager mission, which flew past um, Saturn many, many decades ago, meaning this is a totally stable storm. This hexagon stays there, and it rotates, and it's so, so, so weird. But it's a real thing. This is a Cassini mission image on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, that's totally false color. So that is not at all uh, what it looks like. That would be neat, but it doesn't. But again, if we use different parts of the spectrum, if we look in wavelengths that you and I can't see, we're going to discover some very, very cool things. If we just look at this pole using visible light, it looks awesome, but it looks like clouds. We cannot see this hexagon unless we look in uh, infrared. Uh, one more image I want to share with y'all. Again, because we actually went there, we are able to discover some very cool things. So left-hand side, we've got Shepherd Moon Prometheus. On the right-hand side, we've got the Shepherd Moon Pandora. Look at that ring material. Check out how it moves and is perturbed. It totally, totally reacts gravitationally to the moons orbiting, uh, orbiting those, that, that ring material. And so the interaction between the moons and the rings is so, so much more complex than we ever would have known had we not gone there and taken these types of images with the Cassini mission. So just gorgeous to actually to go there and to use different parts of light to actually measure what's going on uh, with, with this part of the solar system. Okay, what about outside of our solar system? It turns out that, you know, looking inside of our solar system, I think is pretty interesting, pretty compelling. There are some very, very cool things that we can look at, but that's not all that exists. In the early 20th century, there was a formal debate because this question was not answered. It was an open question in the world of astronomy. And there was a fellow by the name of Shapley, and he said, there's one galaxy, and it's the Milky Way. We look out into the night sky and we see these smudgy things. They are nebulae. They are material within our own galaxy. And if new galaxies can form, or excuse me, new stars can form within the only galaxy that exists, the Milky Way. This other fellow, Curtis, said, no, you know, we see these smudgy things in the night sky, but they are other galaxies. They're not within our own, and most likely there are more than one, there's more than one galaxy in the universe. Both of them were using the same data, right? They were using state-of-the-art photographs of the night sky at the time. Both of them had valid points, and they both came to different conclusions. They both imagined different things about the state of the universe or the nature of the universe. Turns out, Sir Edwin Hubble helped us answer this question by taking a photograph of Andromeda. So using the Mount Wilson Observatory, he took a photograph similar to this photograph and was able to say, hey, this is totally a different galaxy. This galaxy is not within the Milky Way, therefore other galaxies exist. And uh, we can actually see another galaxy right here, two triangular. And so he ended the debate pretty decisively. He went on to find other t galaxies, lots and lots of other galaxies, and he developed the classification schemes for, scheme for galaxies too. But he only saw galaxies that were relatively close to home and he was only looking in the visible, visible, visible portion of the spectrum. So he wasn't looking at these other wavelengths of light to look at other galaxies. Um, by the way, I just wanted to um, show off one of my students uh, in astronomy this semester took this photograph. So you and I are, can actually take photographs of Andromeda if we so desire. So right there, he did use an SLR camera uh, and he was able to photograph an Andromeda here from the Bozeman area. So he wasn't in the middle of town, but uh, within, uh, within the Bozeman area, you can actually see Andromeda and you can take a nice photograph of it. Okay, so what else can we see if we look out into the night sky? Well, the um, Hubble Space Telescope was, of course, named after Sir Edwin Hubble. And here we can see a beautiful, beautiful, this is, a, again, going to be a, a false color image of the Crab Nebula. So this is uh, 
this is where a, a supernova explosion happens. If you look at this photograph, notice that, yeah, it basically looks like a, uh, an explosion happened in the night sky, right? And um, here we can see a photograph of a crab nebula taken by an amateur astronomer in true color. So I really like to show true color photographs whenever possible so we can see how beautiful these things actually are, how neat they would look if with the naked eye we were able to actually get close enough. So true color photograph. Now, interestingly, this is where Jocelyn Bell Brunel comes back into the story. She was using that, that thing that looked like a whole bunch of wires on a fence, right? She was using that radio telescope and aiming it at various parts of the sky. Again, you can use that, that during the day and the night. And when she aimed it at something similar to the Crab Nebula, she converted the radio waves to sound waves and she heard something really weird. She heard a really regular noise. And it turns out she discovered pulsars, or pulsating stars. There are these stars that go off these bursts of radio waves with an incredibly regular frequency. They are actually more accurate than the world's best atomic clocks, and they are just really, really quickly rotating stars. So let's listen, hopefully, to uh, the Crab Nebula radio waves turned into sound waves.
because they didn't want to get stars within our own galaxy. And they just wanted to focus the camera, uh, taking little breaks as it uh, passed around Earth. But for 10 days, they took photographs of this part of the night sky. If you hold your arm out at arms, uh, hold your hand out at arm's length and pull onto a grain of sand, that's the size of the night sky that they were looking at. That is the, how much of the night sky this photograph represents. And notice, first of all, it's a mosaic. I'd like to show this version of the photograph because it reminds me that it's a mosaic. Um, you can see the, the pieces that are missing in this particular example. A couple uh, stars in our own galaxy for sure, so these ones with the um, pokey things, those are uh, camera effects uh, and you know, not a part of the star themselves. They help us determine that those are stars within our own galaxy. Um, probably that one as well. Basically, everything else that we're seeing in this photograph is its own galaxy. So imagine for a second that idea uh, all by itself. Our galaxy contains eh, 200 billion stars-ish. And so here, remember what size of the night sky we're looking at. We are looking at a piece of the night sky that is this big. And we have almost a countless number of galaxies, so definitely a countless number of stars within this photograph right here. Just gorgeous, absolutely stunning and mind-boggling, I think, personally, to imagine what else is out there in the night sky. Because we just multiply this by the rest of the sky, right? More recently, the James Webb Telescope has done the same exact thing. So we've got a, 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 a deep field by the James Webb. This one, I'm not sure which direction of the sky they were facing, but they definitely got more stars from our own galaxy in it, so all those pokey looking things. But again, we are seeing lots and lots and lots and lots of galaxies that are outside of our own. Just beautiful, mind-boggling, far, far, far beyond anything that Edwin Hubble was able to see with the world Mount Nelson Observatory in California. Also, I want to point out, um, there's some weird stuff in here too. So you see those, they're all reddish looking and they look streaky. Those, it turns out, are actually galaxies that almost certainly are totally normal looking galaxies, but they look weird because of a relativistic effect called gravitational lensing. So their light, as it comes towards us, passes or grazes by another galaxy and looks super weird, but they are really just regular old galaxies. Now, the James Webb did some interesting analysis. So remember, this is a whole bunch of different wavelengths stacked on top of each other so that you and I can see a pretty picture. We can also separate those back out again. So same photograph, we're looking um, here, we're looking in infrared. And what the James Webb was able to do, or the people running the James Webb, were able to take this weird looking galaxy and this weird looking galaxy and recognize by separating the light back out by wavelength again, those are actually the same galaxy as each other. And that's because, again, gravitational lensing, because the light gets whacked out uh, via relativity on its way here to us from that other faraway galaxy. So, indeed, we're actually seeing, seeing multiple examples of the exact same galaxy being multiplied in a weird way. This one, I don't like this part of um, So, last question I want to think about is, do black holes exist? So, if you're a fan of equations, please look. If not, please avert your eyes. Um, there, we can see the <laughs> gravitational uh, attraction depends on the mass of the two bodies and the distance between them. And so, Newton, Sir Isaac Newton developed this equation, right? And after he developed this equation, very shortly after, people started thinking about the limits, the lower limits and the upper limits. So, in the upper limits, what happens if you've got a really, really, really big mass in a really small area? Well, in theory, it should collapse in on itself, and black holes should exist. This is not a new idea. This is seriously from the 1600s. So many, many hundreds of years ago, people were thinking about this idea. Maybe black holes are a thing. Turns out, black holes are totally a thing. So here, we can see um, a photograph. This is the Chandra X-ray telescope. So on the left-hand side, this is uh, mostly uh, optical image, so how you and I would see it. And then. In that little square, bigger here, we can see how it looks in x-rays. So it turns out that uh, black holes give off massive amounts of x-rays. And so if we use the Chandra X-ray Telescope, the, ec the, the black hole hunter, we can find black holes. And it's really actually not that hard to find black holes. I wanted to show this series of pictures as well. So check this out. If we look in the infrared, 
not super boring, right? That just looks like the night sky. Nothing interesting to see here. Nothing to look at. If we look in the radio waves, something is happening, definitely. There are at least a couple sources where radio waves are being emitted, massive amounts. If we look at x-ray, then we can say, oh, hey, look, there's a thing giving off massive amounts of x-rays. And then if we look at the composite, mix them all together. So again, stacking these different um, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, the parts you and I can see, the parts you and I can't see, we see way, way, way different stuff than if we were just looking at the visible portion of the spectrum. So uh, here is a more recent example of a, uh, specifically from the Shander X-ray Telescope. So again, here we're looking at the op optical portion of the spectrum. And I was just reading about this particular one. This is giving off a flash of X-rays. This is eating, um, this is a feeding black hole. It's eating about the mass of a, a moon, the Earth's moon, about three times a day, which I thought seemed really weird. That's just like us, right? We eat three times a day. Ish. Some of us eat more than that, but um, I certainly do. Nonetheless, uh, super, super weird. This is not well understood. In fact, this is actually a pretty decent mystery. What? How is this thing feeding three times a day? That is such a weird random thing. Nonetheless, it definitely is. And there we see the nice evidence that's giving off these super, super regular flashes of x-rays uh, thrice a day. An actual image has been taken of a black hole. This was the very, very first time this has ever done in, uh, in its uh, history of astronomy. And Katie Bowman was the, uh, the woman in charge of this. We can see here, these are stacks of hard drives. So this is the data that she had to collect in order to produce this photograph. And what we're looking at here is in the um, infrared or radio, so too red for us to see. So normally, black holes, we have to look for indirect evidence. We have to look for x-rays. So this is actually a direct picture of a black hole. So super, super, super exciting. Very, very unusual. So moving forward in time just a little bit, uh, Albert Einstein, when he developed his theory of relativity, he said we should be able to do something completely outside of the realm of vision, outside of the realm of light. We should be able to detect the shaking of the fabric of space and time, which has nothing to do, really, with light rays, right? It's not using that type of telescope at all. He said, if two black holes collide, that would be very exciting, uh, first of all, but second of all, if they do collide with each other, we should be able to feel the fabric of space and time shake. And I do not mean at a personal level, I mean at the kilometer scale level. Um, and indeed, it turns out that black holes definitely do collide, and they definitely create uh, shaking of the fabric of space and time. So let's learn a little bit about that. What are gravitational waves? It all starts back in 1915 with Einstein. He <coughs> hypothesized that all objects with mass would warp the fabric of space-time. If their mass is great enough, those distortions could cause other objects to fall into them. This is what we call gravity. Einstein also predicted that these distortions could travel across the universe, stretching and squeezing space and time as they move. And this is what we call gravitational waves. Later, researchers realized that if two particularly giant masses, like two black holes, are trapped in each other's gravitational field, they should start to spiral in towards each other and so would the distortions they make to space-time. This would create gravitational waves which would travel away from the objects like ripples in a pond. But as these gravitational waves travel through space, they become more and more difficult to detect. In fact, Einstein thought scientists would never see them, but that hasn't stopped them from trying. Enter LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is a conceptually simple piece of kit that aims to measure the distortion in space-time caused by gravitational waves. LIGO works by splitting a laser beam and sending it in two directions. The beams travel precisely the same distance down long vacuum tubes. They're reflected off mirrors, and then they come back and they combine. The light waves of each laser beam are made to exactly line up so that they cancel each other out, and nothing will reach the light detector at the end. But, if a gravitational wave passes through, 
it will minutely distort space-time, changing the distance each laser beam has to travel. That will mean that the waves no longer line up, they won't cancel each other out, and the signal will be detected. The experiment is hypersensitive to disturbances, and so two identical ligers were built on opposite sides of the United States. Both will have to get the same reading at the same time for any signal to be considered valid. LIGO is designed to directly measure gravitational waves. This is different from another experiment based at the South Pole called BICEP-2, which made headlines back in 2014. BICEP-2 is also looking for gravitational waves, but not directly. Instead, it looks for the imprint gravitational waves would leave on the cosmic microwave background. That's the afterglow of the Big Bang. LIGO, on the other hand, is looking for much more recent gravitational waves, created only a few hundred million years ago, by something like the collision of two neutron stars or the merging of two black holes. It's been almost exactly a century since Einstein first predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And now, with LIGO, we may finally be able to tell if it was right.